Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Robcast. This is episode 170, and uh, I got to be honest this morning, I got like a happy, warm, buzzy, I kind of have a happy, warm, buzzy feeling all the time, but especially I have a morning after version this morning because my boy Pete Holmes and sweet lady Val got married last night, and uh, I mean, it was it was in a vineyard, and... They exchanged their vows under an oak tree, and I gave a wedding sermon, and then we danced, we boogied, and then there was an ice cream truck. Are you, are you seriously? When there, when an ice cream truck pulls up, you know this wedding has just gone to another level. So I got like that. So uh, this morning, uh, <laughs> Kristen too, you know that feeling when you're like your heart is overflowing and you have that warm, buzzy, good vibes feeling, but you're also moving a little slowly. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Speaking of that happy, buzzy feeling, next Largo show is November 18th, and I'll be doing a, br um, I'll do be doing a, be doing a brief overview of everything. <laughs> um, and I am kind of mean that over the top, and I kind of mean, no, I'm, I want to explain the whole thing. Um, so that'll be November 18th. And then uh, a couple, well, I was going to say like a week before that, middle of November, I'm going to be in Nashville because when I was on the Bible Belt tour this summer, I noticed how many people were trying to make sense of growth, change, waking up. All of these people everywhere I go are like, hey, wait, I, something, something's happening what is happening here? Because the old thing isn't working and there's something new being birthed. And how do we talk about it? So I was like, I should come back to the heart of the South, Nashville, let's say. And I'm going to talk about atoms and enlightenment and awakening and how we change and how you think about tribes and tension and growth and how all this works. And are things more polarized than ever? Or does it just appear that way? And if it is, what do you do about that? What do you do when it feels like you're out of step with the tribe that you came from? And we have some big problems we need to solve quickly, or we're going to have even bigger problems, and yet not everybody realizes just how serious it is, and how do you, how does change happen, and how do we wake up, and how do we not become obnoxious uh, when we see things, for those who might not see what we see. All these questions are in the air, so I'm going to do two days, and it's mostly new content I'm going to do in Nashville, and would love for you to be there, and uh, so all that's going on, all that info, of course, is at robbell.com, but this episode... Oh, I've been, uh, I've been thinking about this episode for a long time. And what's really interesting is, to, to me, is, is the creative process, how, how things come to be, where ideas come from. Because generally, I get an idea and I know right away what it is. Like, oh, this is a book. It's almost like the idea, the content is announcing to me right away, like, I'm a, I'm a Robcast episode, I'm a tour I'm a novel, I'm a screenplay, I'm a two-day event, I'm a, um, the ideas generally seem to already be talking to me about, about their form, what they are, but this idea, uh, my first thought was the idea was just a t-shirt, <laughs> uh, and then I was like, oh, this idea is in the name of a band, and then I was like, oh, this is, a, um, this is like a mug, I, like, it felt like a slogan, but I realized that this this idea had worked on me so deeply for so many years. And then this week, uh, and I have a list here. Once again, we're working with paper. I have a list of uh, broadcast episodes that I'm working on. And um, it's right here somewhere. Yeah, it's like a, a whole page of just, oh, we need to talk about that. We need an episode on that. And this idea suddenly this week was just like, and 99% and, and of the time, I know exactly what the idea is supposed to be. But this idea, all of a sudden this week, was like, I'm a Robcast episode. Let's do this. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Um, it was like that clear. So this one, my friends, this episode, this thing is coming in hot. And uh, I want to hand you something that I got from somewhere else. And I'm telling you, this thing... Uh, my goal by the end of the episode is whoever you're listening to this episode with, you're saying it to them, or the first person you run into after you see this, you tell them this, because 
Um, this one you can take with you wherever you go. Now, I got this, the, the phrase, from a movie, from my favorite movie. So, uh, to, to tell you about the movie, I first should probably tell you about my five favorite movies. Um, I haven't really done lists on the Robcast before, but here we go. Uh, my five favorite movies, working up, of course, to my favorite movie, which will then lead us into what, what I want to talk about the rest of the episode. My five favorite movies, here we go, number five, Sing Street. Please tell me you've seen Sing Street. Come on. You know what? Pause the Robcast if you haven't. Pause this episode. Go watch Sing Street. Actually, go buy it. Buy the DVD and keep it next to your television. Um, yeah, just go, just trust me. Okay, that's number five, Sing Street. Number four, favorite movie ever, La La Land. Obviously. And if you're like, yeah, but that opening scene on the freeway is totally over the top. That is just ridiculous. Uh, no, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm going to agree with you on everything Everything you're going to say about La La Land, I am going to agree with you. And then I'm going to say, and it's totally awesome. That movie, my family, we own that movie. Like we literally bought the DVD and we watch it on a regular basis. That's the La La Land level around here. Um, and they shot one of the scenes like right around the corner from our house, which I just realized is a joke in the movie that I just said to you seriously. But I mean, seriously, it goes deep for me with that. Number three favorite movie ever, Ishtar. Now, uh, whew, I know some of you are like, he did not just say Ishtar, especially those of you who are well versed in the history of film are like, he did not just say Ishtar. Yes, I just saw Ishtar. Ishtar, for those of you who uh, aren't, don't go this deep in movie world, <laughs> Ishtar was a movie that was made starring uh, Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman. And they were like at peak power, and they made this big budget movie, and I believe it was North Africa, that bombed hard. It was like, like known as the biggest bomb of a movie. And um, they play these two struggling songwriters in New York City, and they can't get any gigs, and they write all their own songs, and the only gig they can get is in some remote area of North Africa. And so they go there, and the CIA gets involved, and then there's a prophecy in that region about some messengers or prophets who will come from the West. You see where this is going, right? But the songs, Saturday morning, the sound of your lawnmower, it touches my heart. I mean, the songs in this movie. And if you meet somebody who's also a fellow Ishtar devotee, you'll just start singing the songs together. She said, look, there's a wardrobe of love in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, seriously, get me started on that movie. Um, that movie was such a flop that later when Kevin Costner made that movie Waterworld, and it was a huge flop, they nicknamed it Fish Tar. <laughs> Just to stress what a bomb it was. But I'm telling you, Ishtar, that thing will change your life. I literally bought a bootleg DVD of that movie that somebody had made from a VHS copy and then just photocopied the cover and sold the DVD. <laughs> oh, I could go on on that forever. Uh, number two, Comedian. Have you seen the movie Comedian? This movie, uh, Jerry Seinfeld finished his show, Seinfeld, and a while after the show was over, he starts going out at night in Manhattan and doing stand-up, starting from scratch with all new content. So there's some like late Friday night club packed with people just hearing whatever comedians, and then the host says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, surprise guest tonight, Jerry Seinfeld. And then Jerry would go up. And you can imagine the crowds are like, what? How lucky? What? And here's the thing. At first... He starts with all new content and some of the jokes like bomb. And literally he gets heckled by the audience a number of times. A couple times he just seizes up. He doesn't know what, what like the punchline is. And he just sort of pauses and then he has these little notes on his stool that he breaks up on stage with him that are like his, uh, like the jokes that he sort of jotted down and he has to like look at his notes. It's so awkward that it's awesome. And then he's like, well, and literally to one crowd, he says, I had a television show. I made it. 
I made a lot of money. Why am I here with you? Why am I doing this? And so a film crew follows him as he essentially asks all these questions, like, why am I going out and doing this difficult thing? I don't have to be doing this. And every single person I've recommended that movie to, to a person, they talk about how convicting, how revealing, because it's about what are you here to do? And if you did have all your bills paid forever, what would you do? And would you, would you go back out and keep doing the thing that you're doing? Uh, I mean, that movie, comedian, I'm telling you. <sighs> and then, number one favorite movie ever, Chariots of Fire. Come on. And some of you right now, you're already singing that. Remember that song? Those dudes in sort of those cut-off pajamas running down the beach? Da -na 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 -na. You know what I'm talking about? You're already hearing that. That movie, I think it came out when I was like nine. Um, and it's sort of, uh, it's a little sentimental. And I know that you're already pictured, if you've seen the movie, that scene where he's like, when I run, I feel his pleasure. You're already mocking me. I get it. I don't care. I'm in all the way on that movie. And you're like, yeah, but it's kind of over the top and some of the religious stuff. I don't care. I don't care. That movie. Whew. Now, in the movie, there's a guy who has some religious convictions from a very, very strict conservative religious background. And he gets to the Olympics, but the race that he's going to race in is on a Sunday and he won't race on the Sunday because of his religion. And uh, he's a man of principle and and so I know you're, uh, you're thinking, it sounds a little heavy-handed. No, 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 stay with me here. So there's the, the sort of leaders of the British Olympic group, and they don't know what to do because their star athlete won't run on a Sunday. But another one of the runners, he gets a medal. So there's this uh, reception cocktail party, and the other runner goes in to meet with sort of the head honchos, and he says, okay, here's the deal. I know you got a problem, but how about this? I already got a medal, so my next race, I don't need to run in it because I already got a medal, and it's not on a Sunday, so have him, have Eric Little run in my place in this other race, and that'll solve your problem. Um, I'll, I'll already have my medal, and then he can race, and I get to watch him run, and it's not on a Sunday, and everything's good. And there's an old gentleman, Lord Cadigan. He's got his sort of jutting, his chin juts out, and he's staring straight ahead, and he says, that's a decision for the committee. And then Lord Birkenhead says, we are the committee. <laughs> Raise your glasses. So good. That's a decision for the committee. We are the committee. And you don't say it like it's a question, like, uh, uh, we're the committee? No. And it's not this like heavy handed over the top judgment, like we're the committee, deal with it. It's like this convicted, grounded, sure and certain, we're the committee. You say it with weight. You say it with a certain timber in your voice. You say it with some gravitas. We are the committee. Because Cadigan's essentially like, well, that's an interesting idea. That would solve our problem with the runner and something and all that. But, you know, that's a decision for the committee. And then Birkenhead's like, yeah, but we are the committee. We're the ones who decide. Let's do it. <sighs> My friends, how many times have you been searching for that which you already possess? How many times have you been waiting for someone to give you permission to do the next right thing when you're the person to give yourself the permission? How many times have you been assuming that somebody in power is going to give you the power to do whatever it is that you need to do next, only to discover that you've had the power the whole time. How many times have you had one perspective, one way of seeing things, and then you gradually began to see it in a new way and you found yourself thinking, 
can I, can I just think about it that way? Can I leave this old perspective behind? And something within you was like, oh, I don't know. You're going down a slippery slope. This could get dangerous. I don't, can you entertain those thoughts? And then you realized, yeah, yeah. How many times have you been waiting for someone to give you the green light? And then you look down and you've had a green light there in your lap the whole time. You've been holding the green light in your hands the whole time. You've been saying at some deep level of the soul, well, I don't know, that's a decision for the committee, only to discover you are the committee. <laughs> Let me talk about what this means in the ways that we actually live our lives, in sort of everyday warp and woof sort of ways. Uh, episode 99 of the Robcast, I interviewed a fantastic woman named Leith McHugh, and she sat in this chair right in front of me here, and she told about what it was like for her 11-year-old daughter to die and what it's like as a mother to have given 11 years to caring for one that came from you and then to lose your daughter. And I know so many of you mentioned that episode, like it just did something to you. And what she talked about is how after that, the pain was so great. She and her husband, Aaron, realized we need to reboot our lives. So they put the word out on Facebook that they were getting rid of furniture and they sold their house and they literally got rid of their stuff and started over. Um, and they sort of systematically went through their lives and says, let's just reboot the whole thing. And once you go down that road, you're like, well, seriously, let's start over. Like everything, let's end it and let's start again. And uh, so the interview was deeply moving, but it was also really, really interesting how they had just sort of systematically gone about this. And I was saying to her questions like, so um, what about somebody who's been through something horrific, traumatic, some, a breakup, a loss, a divorce, failure? What do you say to them? And she's like, oh yeah, you can for sure reboot your life and it will be better. Um, I got an email from her recently. She and her husband, Aaron, have been, they did a reboot your life event. They just put out the word that they'd be doing an event and you could register for it and they were going to take you through all sorts of interesting experiences to help you reboot your life. And she sent me all these pictures of people who came to their event and ate good food and talked about all these things and talked about how to unclutter your life and how to reclaim the importance of pleasure. And they like had a whole thing they just created and took people through. Can you do that? Can you do that? Like you go through all this pain and trauma and it does something to you and you learn some things and then you have this driving desire to share what you've learned with other people. Can you just like do that? Can you just put on an event? I don't know. I don't know. Can you? That's a decision for the committee. <laughs> Wait, we are the committee. Are you with me on this? Can you just do it? Yes. Yes. Apparently you can. I was talking to a mom uh, earlier this year. And she was talking about the struggle that her high school daughter is having. And her high school daughter goes to a school that is known for the mean girls. You know what I'm saying? At that school, you know what I mean by mean girls? Like that school is known for just, just landmines everywhere with um, the way kids treat each other. And she said that her daughter was really struggling, like eating disorder level struggling uh, with the environment and expectations. And, and she was just sharing how difficult it's been. And obviously life is difficult. Obviously your kid can't be protected from everything, but there is this fine line between challenge, which is good. It helps shape a kid. It helps us get stronger. There's challenge. And then there's something that's just crushing your kid's soul. There's, uh, there's, there's difficult circumstances. There's difficulty, but then there's like damaging to your kid's spirit. You know what I'm saying? And like as a parent, you can't protect your kid from lots of things. And you want them to, to I mean, you want them to have things where they, that push them and stretch them. Struggle and difficulty and challenge is absolutely necessary to shape and form us, let alone kids. But, but what sh this mom was talking about was not that. She was talking about that thing that happens when your kid's truly suffering and the environment and she was saying, you know, well, I just, 
you know, I just tell my kid, you just got to just got to get through it. You just got to sort of stay there and stick it out. I'm like, no, you know what? You're the committee. <laughs> You're the committee. You are. You, the mom, the dad, the parentals. You make decisions. And if something is truly, truly crushing the spirit, then you got to do something else. And you, you have to have the guts and the courage to say to the system, uh, we'll take it from here. This isn't working. You are the committee. Those of you parents, you have this kid, you have that kid. And it's like you have this parent gut that's telling you that this particular path the kid is on isn't right for this kid at this time. And yet there's this dominant system that's saying, yeah, this is normal. This is just what you do. And the question begins to arise, maybe we should take our kid out. Maybe we should put our kid in that school. Maybe we should have our kid do that program. Maybe we should have our kid do some sort of online thing. Maybe our kid should do some sort of, like, maybe the, the idea gets birthed of some alternate path for your kid. And you think, well, I don't know. It's a decision for the committee. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You are the committee. Or the number of people I meet who are looking for spiritual community, looking for a tribe, a new tribe that they can grow and they can give and they can serve and they can learn with and they can eat with and laugh with and dance with. And they're like trying to find, they're looking around trying to find this new community. They're waiting around for someone else to start it. Um, here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is no committee. Why? Because <laughs> you're the committee. Yeah. And you're like, why doesn't somebody... And the idea said, so, well, maybe we should just start something in our backyard. Maybe we should start something in our living room. Maybe we should get some other people together and we should just rent a little space and we should just try some stuff. We should just have it as a giant experiment. And you're thinking, well, can we do that? I don't know. That's a decision for the committee. Wait. We are the committee. Or, and the one I've seen so much is with boundaries. You've uh, got some interactions that are toxic that drain you, that are destructive, and yet you have this sense of duty and obligation, like, well, but we're supposed to. Thanksgiving's coming up. And you're like, well, we're supposed to. Just sit there and take it for seven hours because, you know, the pecan pie will be worth it. Hold on. If it's not a healthy environment, if you're going to spend the next two weeks <laughs> detoxing, then you need to set up boundaries. You need to limit your interactions. And if you're thinking, well, I don't know, I don't know if we can do that. I mean, could, could we just say we're only coming for an hour? Could we just say uh, we'll be here for that, but we're not going to be coming around for that? Can you do that? Can you do that? That sounds like a decision for the committee. Yeah, it is. And you're the committee. <laughs> you're the committee. See, oftentimes we end up with this low-level bitterness and anger, this passive resignation. I guess this is just how it is. And we point to these other people and how much they're the problem. Um, but the problem is we haven't owned our own power. We're still blaming it on the committee <laughs> when we're the committee. We decide. So, so part of it is owning your own power and your own strength and your life and the goodness and rightness of what you're here to do. See, neighborhoods... Families, family systems, extended families, tribes, workplaces, industries, communities, faith communities, nonprofits, businesses, develop a center of gravity of consciousness, a dominant way of thinking, a dominant consciousness, how things are done. Group think, party line, well, this is how it's done here. And what happens in the course of life is new life gets birthed within you. Spirit is on the move. And sometimes it builds up over time, but oftentimes it's instantaneous. Y you realize you don't see it that way anymore. You don't see things the way you used to, the way many of the people around you still see them. Things are bigger, wider, more risky, more beautiful, more expansive, more complex, more ambiguous. They're pulsing with more life. They've got more heat around them. Whatever it is, is more life because that's how spirit works. Spirit draws you into greater and greater life. And here's the thing. Spirit isn't intimidated by form. Spirit 
doesn't say, well, you know, there's all this new life in that direction, but you're right, that would be breaking some rules, so we probably shouldn't do that. Spirit doesn't care. Spirit, spirit is ambivalent about form. By the way, we should probably at some point do a whole episode about spirit and form and the relationship between the two. But like Jesus has this great line about spirit. He says, spirit's like wind. <laughs> it blows wherever it wants. And the reason why I'm laughing is how fantastic is that as a metaphor, right? Put that on your doctrinal statement. Oh, it's like the wind. <laughs> it's as if Jesus says, I don't exactly understand why we wake up the way that we do. I don't exactly understand why people are given vision and direction and passion for things uh, that doesn't always make sense. <laughs> yeah, you can't explain how it works. Think about your own growth. Think about the things that you've seen that changed, changed everything for you. Think about the moments when you moved into greater compassion, maturity, depth. Were they planned? Was it part of a seven-step technique? I don't know, you met this person, you were dancing at this thing, you ate this meal with this person, you read this book, this thing fell out of the sky, you saw a bird there, your dog did this, your kid did this, you went to work and had that experience and suddenly you're like, oh my word, there's no going back, now I gotta go this way, right? That's how it works at some level. New life gets birthed, and new life is rarely respective of the forms, because the forms are organized around the previous chapters. That worked earlier, and it's not necessarily right and wrong, it's earlier and later. Earlier, when I saw the world that way, the way that I'd arranged my life, the form, was congruent with spirit. But then... I saw something new. Then I came across a new idea. Then I interacted with somebody who helped me see things in a whole new way. And so now you're going to have to rearrange the forms to keep up with spirit. Are you with me on this? We're going to have to spend our time differently. We're going to have to give energy to different things because now we think about things in different ways. And when this begins to happen, what often happens is all sorts of assumptions are revealed that you didn't previously know were assumptions that you had. They get exposed. You suddenly realize, oh wait, you're right. I was assuming that these were the rules and now I find myself challenging the rules because to be true to spirit's guidance, to the thing the divine is doing here, to where I know the life is, because we always go where the life is. Foundational rule of the whole thing. You go where the life is, and the life is in this direction. And if I go in this direction, I'm going to have to challenge a number of assumptions that I've been living according to, because tribes, family systems, communities, businesses, industries generally have a dominant center of gravity of consciousness that says, this is how things are done. And when you wake up and when spirit is on move and you are following spirit, you realize, oh, there are a bunch of rules here that no longer apply. Now, uh, let me give you an incredibly trivial example because sometimes a ridiculous example can help us see it and then we begin to see it at all sorts of other levels. About a year ago, <laughs> I realized that I'm happiest when I'm outside, that, that the more hours a day that I spend outside, the better my life is. So I started going through my day and things I do thinking, well, could I do that outside? Could I do that outside? Like for example, email. I have a computer at a desk in the back house here that I'm at right now, and that's where I would do email. I was like, wait, but if I had a laptop, I could sit outside and do email. So I started doing email outside. And I'm laughing because this example is so ridiculous. But I literally was like, wait, I guess I've always thought that you do your work. Oh, huh. I've been operating under the assumption that you work indoors at a desk. But I could work outdoors in a chair. Maybe I could put a desk outside. <laughs> Look at me now. I'm like getting crazy now. Wait, stop it, Rob. <laughs> Whoa there, dude. Uh, but just this one realization a year ago at the age of whatever I was, 40 something, 46. I'm like, I am now <laughs> going to try and spend, I'm going to organize my day 
around spending as much time, as much of the day as possible outside. That will be the new measure of a day. How much time do we spend outside? And I'm telling you, we're a year in. It's fantastic. Just fantastic. Now, once again, completely ridiculous example. But this is what happens. You suddenly realize that there was an assumption there that you no longer need to live according to. And this can happen with issues of duty and responsibility. Well, you know, it's just something we have to do. Why? Why? And it if, is, if it is a true responsibility, if it is a duty in the highest, most honorable, dignified sense of duty, then you will not go into it passively dragging your feet like I guess we're supposed to. You will go into it with, this is the right thing to do here. Why? Because the committee decided. And who is the committee? We are the committee. So sometimes you'll meet people who say, well, that's nice, but I have all these obligations. You would not talk about them that way if they were actually obligations. You would say, oh, no, I have some things that I am committed to because they are the right thing to do. And if I don't do them, it would diminish me as a person. You see the difference there? So oftentimes people have passively resigned themselves to things instead of actively making peace with them. This happened. This is the right response to it. So now I'm committed and I will be doing this for the next while, whatever it is, because it's the right thing to do and it is what is demanded of me. And I will say a big giant yes, actively, because the committee has decided so. Yes, it's the move from disempowerment to empowerment. And here's the thing about disempowerment. Disempowerment always has an underbelly of despair. Despair is always lurking on the underbelly of disempowerment. I guess this is just how it is. Well, it's not like you can change it. This is just my lot in life. This is, this is just how the dice were rolled. No, no. The move here is from disempowered to empowered. Even if it's something that happened to you that's beyond your control, you still respond to it with, and now I must respond, and here's how I will respond, because I decide, and this is what I've decided, is the right thing to do. You have more power than you realize. If you are blaming somebody else's actions on your lack of joy, you have handed them power that is not theirs. And so you take that power back. Anytime somebody is telling you how bad their life is because of what somebody else did, you have given somebody power that is not theirs. So you take it back. Yeah, that's how it works. It's the move from disempowered to empowered. It's the move from, oh, I guess that's the decision for the committee, and the committee decided to, oh, wait, I'm the committee. You're the committee. We're the committee. Uh, a couple days ago, I got to meet one of, uh, well, one of my three favorite comedians. There's a whole other episode, my list of favorite comedians, but one of my three favorite comedians who has shaped me in innumerable ways is Eddie Izzard. And those of you who are Eddie Izzard fans, you're like, oh yeah, I see it now. <laughs> I got to hang out with Eddie Izzard, which of course was just amazing. But Eddie was doing this show around his new book and uh, so he was showing some pictures from his childhood and he was taking questions from the audience. And so he would be showing pictures, doing like sort of a life story thing. And then every once in a while, they would put up like a Twitter pick, uh, question that had been sent in to him and he would respond to the question sort of spontaneously. And uh, towards the end of the show, up on the screen came a question that somebody had sent on Twitter and the question was, are we fucked? <laughs> that was the question. Uh, because Eddie's getting into politics, and uh, so he had a lot to say about our shared life together and the nature of political structures, et cetera. And uh, when that screen came up, I was struck with, with the question, um, because that's a very real response to the world right now. Like, is this thing, is it really going off the rails? Um, 
will it just sort of write itself or are we, will we have a, a planet in, in a couple hundred years, in a hundred years, in 50 years? Um, what will our grandchildren actually inherit from us? I mean, those are real questions. Um, and can the political process be rescued and redeemed and rejiggered and reshaped or is it, um, so the question, the question names a pain a, an overwhelming disequilibrium that's in the air right now, a disillusionment, a cynicism. It names a despair, which I get it. You have to name it. Um, but there's one response, which is, well, that's a question for the committee. Are you with me on that? Our life together, where things are headed, our care for the planet, how we treat immigrants, uh, how we treat people who aren't like us, the widening gap between rich and poor. Um, yeah, what's going to happen? Where's it going to go? Uh, will politics continue to be owned by corporate interests? Like, I don't know. I don't know. That's a question for the committee. The committee will have to decide that. Oh, that's right. We are the committee. So I get the question, and the question is an important question to get that emotionally out and name it. But, but the answer is no, and the reason no is because we're the committee and we decide. You see how deep this goes? This works on an individual level. This goes all the way to a communal level, to a national level, to the body politic. We're the committee, and, and, and we get to decide. I uh, started hearing the Jesus stories early. But one of the things that really struck me, and this is probably like high school, is I was so struck with when Jesus was asked a question, he responds with questions. Like, rabbi, rabbi, whatever, and he would just respond. Uh, well, how do you read it? How do you see it? How do you interpret it? What do you think? And this was at, a, at, a, like a, a, at an adolescent, like, shaping developmental moment for me. I remember it, it, it it clicked for me. Oh, you like have to own this, this thing, your path, the way you see the world, um, how you spiritually walk through your life. That the last thing Jesus was doing is brainwashing. So this is like the opposite of brainwashing. This isn't, well, you're just supposed to think this, okay? Just be quiet and believe. It was, I don't know, what do you think? How do you see it? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? You're going to have to own this. You're going to have to own, I would, I would add this, you're going to have to own your own committeeness. Yeah. And it's so easy to blame other people. It's so easy to push it off on someone else. But the invitation is to own it. Oh, I decide. I'm the committee. And I actually, when I think back over my life, it has been an unending series of moments when I realized that I had more power to shape things than I realized. I bet you Kristen would say something similar. That you are, you are like, oh, no, this is just how it is. Like this is how, it's, this is how the game is played. And then you realize, oh, unless we decide to play it differently. It's like you, you go, oh, well, these are the rules. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, what about that rule? Look at that. <laughs> that rule is a little wobbly. Do we really have to pay attention to that rule? Because it seems like this thing over here is actually the right path. That's actually what this moment demands. It's like I'm, you just never stop discovering that it's actually a much wider space than it often appears to be. It's like you realize, oh, that was narrow. Oh, good, this feels a little wider. Got a little more room to breathe. Oh, wait. It's like you just keep opening a door into a room and that room is bigger. And then you're in that bigger room, like, oh, wow, there's like room to move and think and you can sort of, and then you realize, oh, there's a door in the corner of this room and you open that door and that room is even bigger. <sighs> that, my friends, is how it works. So the dude comes in to the Olympic leaders and he says, oh, well, you know, hey, actually, I've already got my medal. So why does just Eric run in my place? Because that race isn't on Sunday and 
Cadigan is like, oh, that's a decision for the committee. Lord Birkenhead says, we are the committee. So you, you, say it. Feel free right now, wherever you are. <laughs> You're in traffic, roll the windows down. Say it. <laughs> it's like a mantra. Seriously, if you're going to get a tattoo, how about you and your partner, you and your friends, we are the committee. Maybe you just got to go, I am the committee. <laughs> if somebody has been, uh, somebody's been pushing you around and been stepping all over your boundaries, somebody doesn't respect the dignity and honor that resides within you because you bear the divine image, and just lately the idea has begun to float like a butterfly around your psyche of like, you know what, I don't have to take this. Do, could I just say to this person, no, you won't treat me like that. I don't know. Can you say that? I don't know. That's a decision for the committee. Ah, uh, yes. You are the committee. I picture some parents who have a kid who that kid's path is just going to be unique. Let's be honest. That kid, making that kid go through the system is just going to crush that kid's unique vitality and spirit. And so you, you parents, you need, uh, you need to turn to each other. You need to say, we are the committee. Those of you in business who are like, there's got to be some better way to do this. This whole like sharks circling each other, everybody killing themselves and working all hours of the day and night. Come on, there's got to be some better way to do this. You're like, well, man. Maybe we could, we, can, we could dream it all up again. Yeah, you could. You could. You could do that because you're the committee. That's how it works. That is how it works, my friends. We are the committee. I'd like to see tattoos. I'd like to see T-shirts. I'd like to see the obligatory coffee mug. <laughs> how about just random banners? Like graffiti style. Uh, it's like some graffiti artists. Take that. I'd like to see, I'd like to see the we are the committee stencils. Um, whoever's running for political office in 2020 for president, I'd like that to be your campaign. We are the committee. Like we decide and what we're doing is we've decided to make it better and more equitable and just and fair and, and that representative democracy would actually represent people, right? Because we're the committee and we decide. <laughs> yes, there we go. Now we're on to something. <sighs> My brothers and sisters, May grace and peace be with you.